Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here today. And we, Betty Spani and myself, are going to talk to you about self-supervised learning. We both work as applied research scientists at Samsung Electronics within the R&D division of Samsung Strategy and Innovation Center. The center deals with new business creation for Samsung Electronics by exploring a lot of technological topics such as autonomous vehicles, robotics, digital health, and so on. And um, now let's dive into our subject, self-supervision. What is self-supervision? It's a form of unsupervised learning where the data provides the supervision. In general, some part of the data are masked and the task of the network is to predict it. For example, for image data, it can be in painting or colorization of a monochrome input. What is the intention behind self-supervision? Because producing a new data set for each new task can be expensive, time consuming, and annotations can be hard to obtain, there is a real opportunity in leveraging the vast numbers of unlabeled data uh, produced every day to improve sample efficiency. The goal of this talk is to mitigate the saying that we need a lot of annotations to train deep neural network. Next slide, please. And now I'm going to talk about self-supervision for text. In 2018, Bert uh, put the spotlight on self-supervision by obtaining new state-of-the-art results on 11 NLP tasks. The two Bert self-supervised learning objectives were first to predict random mask words from a context. So it, uh, that's what gives its name, mask language model. And so here you have an example. It's raining today, where is my umbrella? It's a raw text. And a few words of the sentence will be mask. And the objective of BERT is to predict the mask words. Another, uh, the second learning objective is next sentence prediction task. It's to help the model to understand sentence relationships. So BERT is given two sentences, and he has to, under to predict if the second sentence is if the, it's the following of the first one, or if it's a, one, a random one. Next slide, please. Self-supervision gives the model the ability to learn effectively from raw text, alleviating the dependence on uh, supervision. And even in cases where considerable supervision is available, learning good representation in a non-supervised fashion can provide a significant, a significant performance boost. Some research demonstrates that uh, self-supervised pre-training acts as a regularization scheme, enabling better generalization. Therefore, pre-training some model architecture on the language model objective before fine-tuning it for a supervised downstream task has been the most common approach in recent years. The main advantage is that it gives strong performance on many benchmarks. Uh, you remember the 11 NL, uh, SOTA on NLP task. But uh, one downside is that it, uh, a large number of labeled examples are still typically required for each uh, downstream task. Next slide, please. And now let's talk about GPT-3. It was introduced in May 2020, and it's an autoregressive language model, as opposed to BERT, that was a mask language model, which means that it predicts future value based on past values. So here you have an example of how it works. From raw text, we can generate multiple training examples where the task is at every step to uh, predict the next world. The idea behind GPT-3 is to make the whole training self-supervised. It was trained on massive amounts of data, and it is not fine-tuned because the focus uh, is on task agnostic performance. But in principle, it could be fine-tuned. Next slide, please. For each task, GPT-3 has been evaluated under three conditions. First, a uh, few short learning, where the model is given a task description and several uh, examples between 10 and 100. But no weight updates are never allowed. Then you have one shot where the model is given task description in natural language and one example, and zero shot where it's only given task description. And under this condition, the most important thing uh, is that the model has never been trained on any specific task, and yet it achieved uh, impressive results. Next slide, please. We can see, for example, here on the Trivia QA, which is a reading comprehension task, that the one shot and few shot performance uh, in red uh, exceed the performance of the SOTA fine-tuned model, making GPT-3 training on massive data set sometimes more efficient than training on a specific task. And now I'm going to let Baptiste uh, talk about other modalities. 
Okay, hello everyone. So uh, let's talk about uh, self-supervision applied to uh, other modalities. Uh, so we will start uh, with uh, audio. So here is a cool paper uh, from uh, people at uh, Facebook that uh, developed a method and a model called the Wave2VEC 2.0. So uh, the basic idea behind uh, this uh, paper is to apply uh, the BERT uh, method that you've uh, seen uh, previously, but on audio in order to uh, build an automatic speech recognition system. So um, we start from the uh, audio uh, as a raw uh, waveform. Uh, this audio is sent into uh, a CNN okay, to get uh, some uh, latent uh, speech uh, representation. And then uh, this uh, latent speech recognition are mapped uh, into quantized uh, representation that uh, you can see as uh, learned uh, vocabulary on uh, sound. Okay? Uh, then the uh, representation are uh, passed into a transformer, okay? so just like BERT, and uh, there is the uh, masking strategy that is also used. So let's say here that uh, the uh, mask uh, is on the uh, example here in the, in the middle. So uh, that's it. And in the end, um, they use uh, a contrast, contrastive loss. Okay? So the idea is that here, the uh, gray uh, vector has to be uh, quite similar to its uh, quantized representation while being uh, different from the other uh, quantized representation. And using this technique, as we will see in the next slide, they achieve very, very good performance. So here are uh, some results from a paper uh, from Google um, that came a few, few weeks ago uh, that also uses uh, Wave2Vec 2.0 uh, technique. So here we have the word error rate, which is um, basically a measure of the uh, accuracy of a speech recognition system. We have different models from uh, 2015 uh, until, until now. And what's interesting to see is uh, here in blue. So um, these models uh, are trained only, uh, are fine-tuned, sorry, only using 10 minutes of labeled data. So the pre-training, as uh, we've, we've seen, uh, is uh, uh, performed in the wave to wave 2.0 manner using a large uh, amount of, uh, of, uh, of audio. And then it is fine-tuned only on 10 minutes of labeled data. And here in gray, in gray we can see uh, the result of models that are uh, trained on uh, roughly uh, 1,000 uh, hours uh, of labeled data. So I think it is a very huge result to see that nowadays uh, models uh, trained on 10 minutes of label data can achieve the same uh, performance uh, of models from 2019 uh, that was trained on 1,000 hours of label data. So um, maybe uh, what we are uh, seeing uh, now is a, a belt like uh, moment for automatic uh, speech recognition system. Uh, not, let's have a look as a, at, a, at a funny uh, example of self-supervised uh, learning on, uh, on images uh, this time. Uh, so this is a cool paper from OpenAI uh, called uh, Generative Pre-Training from uh, Pixel. So they train a model uh, called uh, Image GPT. So the first uh, step to train this model uh, is to uh, take some images, don't sample them, uh, Unroll them uh, into a single vector. And the task is the same as the one presented earlier for text, but this time uh, for pixels. So uh, every pixel has to um, predict uh, basically the, the next uh, pixel. Once you uh, have trained your model uh, in, uh, this, uh, in this way, uh, usually what you want is to fine tune uh, the model on a downstream task. So for example, uh, here is a classifier of uh, cats uh, and dog. So you add a classifier on top uh, of, the, of the network and you fine tune uh, the, whole, uh, the whole model. Another thing that you can do uh, is to add um, a classifier um, at a given layer um, in, uh, in the model and only uh, fine-tune this classifier, okay? Uh, so this is called a uh, linear probe uh, approach and the idea is to um, have a measure of the uh, 
to, to see if uh, the representation learned by uh, the network are linearly uh, separable. And we can uh, imagine that um, the uh, linearity uh, separability of uh, the uh, intermediate representation provide uh, basically uh, an idea of um, if they are good uh, or not representation. So here is uh, the, evol the evolution of uh, the linear probe accuracy for a uh, different data set as a function of uh, the layer where the uh, classifier is uh, placed. And uh, so you can see that there is uh, an optimum uh, basically in the, in the middle um, of, the, of the network. And uh, the model achieve 96% uh, of uh, accuracy on C410. Um, without uh, being fine-tuned on it. So uh, we can see that uh, from this really naive objective function, which is uh, predict the next pixel, uh, the model uh, already has learned some uh, powerful uh, representation. So I think this is a very uh, interesting result. And uh, let's see uh, at some uh, example. Uh, so here, um, here are some prediction uh, of uh, image uh, GPT. So we give a part of the image, and the model has to uh, imagine uh, the rest. So I really like uh, the one uh, with, with the cat, where there is this uh, tiny piece of uh, white stuff, and the model has to imagine uh, what's uh, what what it is. And uh, also here, the, the birds uh, are quite impressive. I think uh, you can see the, the reflection uh, of the of the birds uh, in the in the in the water. Um, so now uh, the previous approach was uh, quite uh, brute force. Uh, let's have a look at uh, another one which is uh, more uh, reasonable. Uh, so here is a paper from, um, from, uh, from Google uh, where they've developed a method called uh, SIMCLR. So the idea is, uh, is quite simple. So they, they took um, two, two images. Uh, so here we have one from a dog and one uh, from a chair. Um, they take a different um, patch of the images. So here we can see that uh, the head of the dog has been selected, and here uh, it is uh, the, the, the leg. They also um, add some that, uh, data augmentation. So here the uh, images is in gray, great, uh, gray uh, scale, sorry, and so on. Okay. They, uh, this data goes uh, into a neural network to provide an output uh, representation. Uh, and then um, they once again use a contrastive uh, loss function in order uh, to make uh, patches from the same uh, image uh, to be uh, similar and uh, patches from uh, dif different images uh, to, be, uh, to be different. And here are the, the results that uh, they get. Okay, so once again, uh, so this result uh, shown the accuracy of a linear classifier trend on the representation learned uh, with different self-supervised uh, method. So only uh, the, the, the classifier is, uh, is trained. And you can see with their method, uh, they can uh, reach uh, the performance of a supervised model but of course, there is a drawback. They have to uh, use much more uh, parameters uh, than the, the model that is, uh, that is supervised. But I think this is a very uh, impressive result. And here are uh, some results about the uh, sample efficiency of uh, the, the method. So here they only use 1% uh, of uh, the uh, image net uh, data set, and uh, they achieve uh, the, this kind of performance that you can see here. So if we do a fair comparison with the ResNet model here at 75% um, of accuracy compared to the baseline at um, 48% uh, percent of accuracy, we can see that uh, their proposed method really uh, outperforms uh, the supervised uh, baseline in the uh, low resources uh, region. And now I'm going to uh, let uh, Luis talk about uh, bias in self-supervision. Yes, I'm going, I'm going to finish this talk by mentioning some ethical issues of uh, self-supervision, and one is bias. So next slide, please. While self-supervised pre-training increases model performance, there are concerns about the fairness of these models. Since pre-trained representations are obtained from learning on massive data, there is a danger that stereotypical biases in the real world are reflected in these models. 
So here is uh, an example of GPT-3 analysis that showed that male names are more likely to be associated with career terms than female names, especially with occupation demonstrating higher levels of education, such as leg legislator or banker. In the other hand, female names were more likely to be associated with occupations such as midwife, nurse, receptionist, or housekeeper. And on this table, you can see that females are more often described using appearance-oriented words such as beautiful or gorgeous, as compared to men who were more often described using adjectives that cover a larger spectrum. Next slide, please. Another bias is a racial bias. Similarly, uh, Timmy Brown and all explored how uh, in how race impacted sentiment. And they found that African and Middle Eastern names are more likely to be associated with unpleasant terms than European American names uh, in GPT-3. And I'm gonna mention another example in image this time. This summer, there was a discussion that happened among AI researchers as a result of bias found in the model associated with the paper from S. Menon and R. Uh, Pulse. The sub-supervision was made on a dataset mainly containing white people picture, basing the model in favor of outputting images of white people, leading to the disturbing examples such as the white Obama you can see and the absence of Asian features in the woman in the left picture. And two different visions are confronted. Are the data only responsible for the bias? Or should it be the responsibility of the researchers to eliminate such bias by working on the algorithm and making algorithmic choice uh, guided by properties of the data and their social consequences? We should note that there exist some uh, recommended best practices for addressing potential bias in applied AI research. Uh, for example, the idea of model cards that is a framework to encourage transparent model reporting. Next slide, please. And to conclude, self-supervision has demonstrated its ability to provide good representation on different modalities. We've seen text, images, audio, video. It, uh, less, uh, it, self with self-supervision, less label data are required and it gives better performance, but it often goes with uh, more compute power. However, there are uh, several drawbacks to overcome. First, we mentioned it, how to mitigate bias uh, in these massive data sets to make them in line with our values. Uh, they are so huge that we cannot go through any example of these data sets. And uh, another drawback is that only a few major industrial actors can afford large supervised free training. Uh, I've read somewhere that it, could, it was estimated that GPT-3 cost uh, Several, uh, several million dollars. And what about academics? How can they follow this trend? And we should ask ourselves when and where uh, does the compute race end? You can see on the graph on the right, it's a graph from the GPT-3 paper. And uh, for the largest model, the validation lost is not even uh, uh, at the end yet, which means that the model has not been trained uh, to its uh, fullest uh, potential. So we should uh, yes, ask when and where does the compute race end? And last, uh, how can we combine the different modalities in one pre-training? And that's it for me. Thank you for listening to our talk. And if you have any questions,